Anthony Collins is one of the legal partners supporting Meningitis Research Foundation. And today I'm doing a short video on some of the most common questions that people have about a clinical negligence claim. It's not just where there's blame, there's a claim. So the legal test for a clinical negligence claim is broken into two parts. The first is known as a breach of duty. This is where the care and treatment that's been provided has fallen below a reasonable standard of care. The second part is known as causation. You have to prove that any breach of duty of care that you have identified has caused an injury. For meningitis claims, concerns typically center around delays in diagnosis or a misdiagnosis, which has then led to a delay in treatment. It's often the second part of the test, causation, which is the more difficult aspect, and there needs to be a careful consideration of each of the facts of each particular case. Expert evidence is key in determining as to whether or not there has been a breach of duty and whether or not that has caused an injury. As you may know, Meningitis Research Foundation have a helpline. So if you do have any concerns about the treatment that you or a loved one has received, then please speak to one of the advisors on the helpline. Alternatively, you can make contact with a solicitor for initial advice, but please ensure that they are a specialist clinical negligence solicitor with experience in meningitis claims. The Meningitis Research Foundation website has a list of trusted legal partners, all of whom would be happy to help. Once you've spoken to a solicitor and you want to take matters forward, the first thing to consider is making a formal complaint under the NHS complaints procedure to the hospital trust if you're concerned about hospital treatment or to the practice manager if you're concerned about a GP or a practice nurse. You're entitled to receive a full written response to your complaint. Additionally, under the new duty of candor, clinicians now have a duty to tell you if there have been any concerns in relation to the treatment that you or a loved one have received. The hospital or GP practice may then undertake their own independent investigation. You should be involved in that process and you're entitled to a full written report of the findings that they reach. If unfortunately a patient has died or is, as a result of potential failings, then matters may be referred to the coroner who will decide whether or not they need to undertake their own investigation into the circumstances of the death and they may hold a full inquest to determine the cause of the death. Once you're going through the complaints process, at the earliest opportunity, you should apply for a copy of your medical records. Those records will need to be carefully analysed and a full chronology of events prepared. And the earlier that that can be done, the better. So it's, it is important to seek legal advice at the earliest opportunity to help you guide you through each of those processes. This is one of the biggest concerns for people who are considering whether or not to bring a legal claim. There are a number of options available to fund a claim. Legal aid has been cut significantly over the last few years, but it is still available for anyone who's been neurologically injured. And this was caused either during pregnancy, during delivery, or within the first eight weeks of life. And so this funding may be available for uh, any concerns that are centered around young children. If legal aid isn't available, the next option is to consider before the event insurance. So this is commonly attached to things like a household insurance policy, car insurance, some bank accounts or even credit cards have it attached as a benefit. So it's important to check all of those in case you do have the benefit of a legal expenses insurance policy. And so this would cover your legal costs. An alternative is checking whether you have this as a benefit on any trade union cover. Finally, there's a conditional fee agreement, which is commonly known as a no win, no fee. A conditional fee agreement is just that. So if you are unsuccessful in the claim, the solicitor's fees won't be charged. However, there are additional fees that you may be responsible for. And so your solicitor should advise you to take an out and after the event insurance policy. This will cover you against those additional fees. So for example, experts fees, experts are 
paid regardless of the outcome of the case. And they can run into many thousands of pounds. So an out of the event insurance policy protects you against those costs as well as any other adverse costs. If you are successful, then your compensation is paid for by the defendant as well as your basic legal charges. But there are fees that then are payable under the terms of the conditional fee agreement. The first is what's called a success fee. And this is capped at about to be no more the value of your general damages, which is the amount that you receive for the injury you have sustained and your past losses. So a success fee can never be any more than 25% of that portion of your compensation. In addition, if you're successful, the after the event insurance policy premium is then payable. So once you've gone through the complaints process or the independent investigation, which can unfortunately take several months, and once you've obtained a copy of the medical records, the first step is for your legal team to prepare a very careful analysis of those records and to prepare a detailed chronology of the events. They will then consider instructing a medical expert to provide an expert opinion on the legal tests of breach of duty and causation. That expert evidence is key to determine as to whether or not a claim can proceed. If the expert evidence is supportive, then a letter of claim is prepared in accordance with the pre-action protocol for the resolution of clinical disputes. It's a detailed letter setting out all of the allegations of negligence against those who you were concerned about in terms of treatment. And that's then sent to the proposed defendant, whether that be a hospital trust, a GP, nurse, etc. The defendant then has four months within which to consider those allegations and undertake their own investigations and prepare a letter of response. And that's just the initial steps that are involved in a clinical negligence claim. There is a strict time limit before court proceedings need to be issued. This is three years from the date that the negligence occurred or from the date of when your knowledge of the negligence occurred. It's important that you discuss this with your solicitor and you're aware of the limitation deadline. As if this date is passed and court proceedings have not been issued, then your claim becomes statute barred. For any claims that involve a child, the three year time limit doesn't start to run until their 18th birthday. So effectively they have until their 21st birthday within which to issue court proceedings. So that was just a very short run through of what is involved in the early stages of a legal claim. Please do feel free to ask any questions in the comments or contact MRI directly. Um, but I hope that you found that short video useful.